believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. From time, or for, from, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. start prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are a mighty God, worthy of all of our praise, glory, and honor, Lord. Lord, help us to not be so caught up with the things of this world, especially material things, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, to think of your holiness and your, your law and your grace and your mercy, and Lord, that we will spend an eternity with you based on our faith in Jesus Christ alone. That when we believe in Jesus Christ, all of our filthiness is gone and we, we take on the robes of righteousness of Jesus. We thank you and praise you for that. Lord, fill us with the light of Jesus. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we may be uh, children of the Most High. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you might wonder why we read that scripture and I wanted to read it again where we didn't stop at chapter breaks and everything. There, were, The church was filled with such awe and they were in such... Uh, a heartfelt position that they wanted to worship God and meet together all the time and share things, and they didn't consider things their own. They considered things given to them by God so that they could be rich to others if they were, in fact, rich. And there was a man named Barn Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who sold a field and gave it at the apostles' feet. He didn't worry about what they did with the money. He knew they had, had enough sense to use it for God's kingdom. And then right at the same time, just right after that, there's a man named Ananias and Sapphira who had a man and woman who had greed in their heart, who were covetous. Oh, that takes me back to the Ten Commandments and that one thou shalt not covet. That's the furthest one from God, isn't it? It's the one least like Christ that there ever could be. And we're supposed to be as the church like Christ in this world, his hands and feet. So I read that to start us off so that I would give you this title, A Fool and His Money. What's the rest of it? Almost everybody got that one. Is that a Bible verse? No, it's not a Bible verse, but it, it has, some, has some biblical knowledge about it, but you know what that means. A fool and his money soon come to be parted from each other. And that's in this world. Guess what that means for eternity? Hmm. Because all riches, all things are from God. They are heavenly. And the other place that we're talking about where you're going to possibly go if you're foolish and don't turn and repent to God, there will be nothing good, nothing of value, nothing whatsoever. So that fool will be forever parted from God and His wonderful grace. But all you've got to do is Repent and turn to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your soul. So this is a phrase you might think in the Bible. There's a lot of those out there, but it came to pass around in the 1500s is when it came to, to pass. 
It implies that a fool spends his money quickly and rashly on unimportant things. That's how it originally was intended. I think it has a lot more meaning today than even that because, you know, our words and phrases change. And therefore, since he spends his money foolishly and without thought, it soon parts. But there's so much more than that because you could spend your money foolishly and God still give you money or crops in this case that we're going to get to in Luke chapter 12. You might not run out. You might, do, you might continue to spend money foolishly. But the way to spend money wisely, the way to spend your talents wisely, the way to spend your health wisely is to spend them on the kingdom of God. If He's given you health, spend it for Him. If He's given you money, spend it for Him. If He's continued to give you time in your years, spend it for Him. Everything is His and He's given it to you by His grace so that you will live for Him, His praise, His glory, His honor, His kingdom, His will. <clears throat> Definition of a fool from Webster's Dictionary. A person who acts unwisely. A silly person. But there's so much more than that. Let's go back to Webster's 1828. I did it before. I will do it again. One who is destitute of reason. Destitute, without reason whatsoever. Or the common powers of even understanding. An idiot. Puts a little light on it, doesn't it? Second definition, a person who is somewhat deficient in intellect, but not an idiot. Or a person who acts absurdly, one who does not exercise his reason, one who pursues a course contrary to the dictates of wisdom. Two different definitions there. But in Scripture, the third definition, a fool is often used for a wicked or depraved mind and heart person without God in their heart or mind. So they live for themselves, for the author of this world, the one who has the power of this world that doesn't have the power anymore because he was defeated at the cross by Jesus. One who acts contrary to sound wisdom in his moral deportment, one who follows his own inclinations, who prefers trifling, trifling and temporary pleasures to the service of God and eternal happiness. Wow, that's a definition, isn't it? You know, the Scriptures don't use the word fool that much. I mean, that might be because your mama said not to <laughs> call anybody a fool. I don't know. It uses wisdom so much, time and time and time again. But there are times when the Bible uses the word fool. In Psalms 14, starting out in verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's why he lives the way that he lives, because he doesn't have to answer anybody. He says it's about here and now, so I'll eat, drink, and be merry. Not that there's anything wrong with eating, drinking, and being merry, but are you living for God and His kingdom? Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, in this, Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is He not your Father, your Creator, who made you and formed you? Why? Why did God create you? Aren't you supposed to bring Him glory and honor? Aren't you supposed to be obedient to His laws? Do His laws not bring about your goodness? Your well-being, they're not something that He's given you to try to keep you restricted. They're for your good. Psalm 53 starts out, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's just like Psalm 14, isn't it? So we've got two Psalms that start out the same way. Have you heard this tune? Get it before? And in Luke 12, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. The one who is the author and creator of life who gave you the life that you have, are you using it for His glory and for His honor? In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 13, But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything illuminated becomes a light. That is why it says... Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ's light will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine or any of the things that can consume you from this world, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit of God. John said earlier this country needed prayer. That's because the days are even more evil, doesn't it seem like it is? They were evil in that time. They were evil in the New Old Testament. They are evil now. They will continue to be evil. And we are called to be the light shining 
to stamp out the darkness until Christ returns. Are you living as a child of light? If you're not, maybe you're living for greed and maybe you're living a hypocritical life, wearing a mask. That's what we just covered the last two weeks. As I said, there's a ton of scripture about wisdom, so I'm going to give you a little bit about wisdom now. From Proverbs 9, verses 10 to 12, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and your years will be added to your life, rather than this fool whose life was required that night. If he had acted graciously and richly towards God in his kingdom, would he have lived to see another day? We don't know from the story, but hey, right here's a proverb that kind of leans that direction. Verse 12, if you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. If he had been rich to others, maybe his riches would have established even more in this world. But you know, they wouldn't have meant anything to him, so he'd probably got more and more riches so that he could be rich to others. Because God gives to those who give. <laughs> That's where we get the prosperity gospel from, even though that's not a good gospel. <laughs> You've heard me say it a million times. Wisdom is a gift given by God. Foolishness is the opposite. It is sin, it is disgrace, and it leads to ruin. Are you foolish or are you wise? And you can only gain wisdom by seeking God who gives it to those who seek it. Solomon in all of his wisdom said the things of this world, everything that he had and tried, which was everything, was meaningless, meaningless, meaningless compared to knowing God and living for Him. Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. It doesn't matter what sin you've had. Look at David's life. It doesn't matter where you are in your power or anything else. It all comes from God and, he, and the forgiveness of sin comes from God. Those whose hearts seek Him and ask for repentance. And you're given the Holy Spirit to help guide you and lead you to live like Christ in this world as long as you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. Psalm 90, starting in verse 10, Our days may come to 70 years or 80, or if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass. Some of you are in your 90s and you know that. And we fly away. If only we knew the power of your... If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Every breath you will take, every breath you have taken is God's will. He has given it to you. How have you lived it for Him? Are you asking to increase your wisdom so that you can live wisely or is there covetousness and greed in your heart so that you want to stay the same and take care of yourself and not rely on daily bread? Give us this day our daily bread. Help us to be content, to not be greedy, to not covet things. In Proverbs 2, verse 1, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commandments within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure... Then you will understand the, the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For He guards the course of the just and protects the way of His faithful one. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Something that was foreign to this rich fool whose life was required of him by God that night. 
Further on, when we get into Luke 18, Jesus looked at them and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of, kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Why is it so hard to let go of those riches for the one who gives all the riches of everything and will give you far more than what, anything that you can gain in this world. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we had food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the roots of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Elsewhere, Paul says that he, that he fights and trains like a boxer would, like an Olympian athlete would, that he never quits putting his body, his spiritual and physical body, through the training necessary to be fit so that he can be used by God in this world. And he warns about the things in this world being a snare just like the author of Hebrews do and the sins that so easily entangle that we need to strip all of that out, off and run together this race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our soul. So is there anything wrong with being rich? No, and the scriptures don't imply that there are one bit. It says it's hard for those who are rich. There are people that are rich. Look at Abraham. Look at David. Look at Solomon and all of his wisdom after he pursued of all, all the riches. We get the understanding from him. Look at Job and how his riches were taken away. He was a rich, rich man. And Satan said, that's the only reason that he, he is faithful to you, God, but it's not. And he said the same thing. I came in naked to this world. Naked I'll leave, but I'm not going to curse God. I'm going to thank God and praise God for who he is. There's nothing wrong with being rich. In fact, if you think of it as in God made you rich, then you've got to think, why did He make me rich? And what can I do with that for His glory and for His kingdom? He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your service. He chooses to let you serve and do things for Him. So how are you living your life for Him, especially with the money? Oh, and the time. <laughs> That's just as valuable. Do you think your time is yours and your money is yours? Or are they God's? Weren't you bought with a price? The precious blood of Jesus Christ? The one who gave up heaven and died for you? He gave it all. Are you giving it all for Him? There is everything wrong with coveting. It is having an idol. It is committing harlotry against your God who has so richly loved you that He would give His one and only Son to save you for all eternity. And He's given you the Spirit to dwell inside of you are temples of the Most High God. Given you gifts to share with others. Leading you into all truth so that you can be like Christ in this world. So how can a Christian say that their money is theirs? And their life is theirs. Their time is theirs. How can you say that, Christian? I mean, that's contrary to what the Bible says. That's contrary to what faith is. That's contrary to what our Lord and Savior lived and taught in this world. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you won't have a place to lay your head. And on top of that, how can a Christian be stingy knowing that their lives are God's and their money came from God? 
Oh, I say that too because, see, there's so many times where you don't even think about it. You just say, oh, this is me and mine. But then when you see, like I said, that circumstance, and you, then you say, oh, well, wait a minute. What I have is mine, and the reason this person doesn't have is because of this or that. Weren't you dead in your trespasses and sin? Every time I get out on the road and watch traffic, <laughs> I have to sit there and go back to, because if somebody passes, you do a 90 mile an hour on a turn and crossing double yellow lines, and you're like, how in the world? And then it just, the Holy Spirit hits me, and I know this is trivial in comparison, but they don't know any better. They're lawless. So how am I going to act? Am I going to try to run them off the road too or give them the, or whatever? Or am I going to pray for them? And beyond that, when I have the opportunity to help someone, am I going to help them? Or am I going to judge lest I be judged? Or not forgive lest I not be forgiven? Or not give so that God can richly give to me? In this world, especially in this country, you're defined by what you do have. Your success, what you've done with your time, your amount of money, the haves and the have-nots. Is that what the kingdom of heaven looks like? Not at all. Take Lazarus, the beggar at the door. And the rich man, when he died, the rich man, there we go again, because Jesus teaches more about the riches and the money because of how they can entangle you. And if you don't think you're rich again, compared to the standard of this world, every single one of you, I don't care how poor you are in the United States, are filthy rich compared to the people in this world and compared to the people in history. I mean, when we don't have power for 18 hours, it's a tragedy. And especially because of the things we might lose in our time and in our possessions. Oh, God forbid if we did lose our stuff in our freezer. Isn't God the one who gave us the food in the first place? In fact, in this country, the more that you have, the better that you are. It is now what is known as the American dream, and that is so far from what the American dream is meant to be. Over time, the phrase American dream has come to be associated with upward mobility and enough economic success to lead a comfortable life. Historically, however, the phrase represented the idealism of the great American experiment. That's from Behold America by Sarah Churchwell. What is that great American experience, uh, experiment, though? The experiment of breaking out to have freedom. Freedom of religion. Freedom from persecution and to pursue the job that you want. Equality, democracy. And yet even with that we carried slavery and, and things in because we covet and we're greedy and we like to label other people. How much more would we be like if we kept following God in the development of this country rather than turning to Him for riches? How much further could this country have progressed to be a Christian nation rather than just a title? If you had a chance to rewrite our government, because we all know that <laughs> we're not there anymore, far from it, and you had to put down just ten things, what would you put? Just ten things. Would you put not murder in there, not steal in there, and so forth? Would you put to not profane God's name? That's in his top ten. Would you put not to covet? I don't think there's any of us here that, it, that if we didn't spend a lot of time in prayer in it first, would have wrote down not to covet. Because we don't think about that. But that covetousness is the furthest away. That's number ten compared to number one. It's the furthest away from God. It is the furthest away from being like Christ because it is the root of all kind of evil and it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle because those things consume you. They become your idols. They, they tear you away. They take you down the wrong path. They take you away from truth and life. They take you away from Jesus who said, give them all up to the rich man who came and said, I have kept all the commands. 
Jesus said, you lack one thing to be complete or perfect. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me because your heart's fixated on things. And you'll never be able to follow me even though you've kept all the laws, which we know we can't. The law condemns us. Paul said, if it wouldn't have been for covetousness, I'd have never understood that because he was so zealous for keeping the law. That's why the Pharisees tied down to the tenth of their mints and everything else, but their hearts were far from God because they coveted. They were greedy. Romans 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. He thought he made it through nine laws. And then when he got to ten, he said, I have failed. How in the world did he get past the other nine? But he thought in his heart he did. But that covetousness broke his heart because he realized he lived for things rather than the creator of all things. He lived for life rather than the giver and sustainer of life. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. It didn't just expose him, but it ripped him naked and bare at the foot of Jesus and said, Who am I but one wearing filthy rags? I need your robes of righteousness to cover me. Paul also writes 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all the things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So Paul is crying out here for the for the Corinthians to back up what they say they believe and to give to those in the church who don't have, who are suffering, and they have. Will they give? But he says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. That heart is where the seed fell upon noble heart and they produced a crop. That heart is what your mind is set on. Well, don't focus on the things of this world, but fix your heart on the things of heaven and serve the Master who is in heaven, Jesus Christ, not the things of this world and the devil. Build up treasures that will last. Where is your heart fixed? Because that's whom you love and who you'll serve. Where is your heart fixed? Because if your heart is fixed, you won't give reluctantly or under compulsion. You'll cheerfully give because that's the same way we were in the church in Acts. They didn't consider the things that they had was their own. I'm sure Barnabas had plans for that land, whatever he was going to do, build his little mountain home, whatever it was. And he said, no, I'm going to sell it and give it to feed people because there's a need here. And I trust and give it to the church, to the apostles, because they have the wisdom to do it because they're led by the Spirit of God. I don't have to get a committee or be involved in this and anything else, see how this is. I'm going to give this money and I'm going to know that the heart is right in the whole church and it's going to help people so they have what they need. Because we're not talking Christian com communism here, but we're talking equality. There is no way that if I see this person doing without, that I can sit over here with having excess and not want to do something about it. It's unbiblical. It's ungodly. It's not like Christ. And if heaven is going to be a place where no one has need and everything else, why in the world would I want that not to be the case now? And if He's given me richly, then I should be richly, or I might be called a fool. And my life might be required. I don't know. I don't know the implications of that. God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to bless you abundantly. So even if you give away all you have and rely on daily bread, He's able to give you more and more if that's what He chooses to do. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, which we should be content with clothes on our back and food in our bellies, you will abound in every good work. That's the last part of that verse, section of verses. The purpose is to make you like Christ in every good work. 
So do you know where you find the Bible verse you can't outgive God? Not a Bible verse again. <laughs> Just like what we started. But it's a principle that could be applied. And like I said, you can make an unsound prosperity gospel out of it. Because the more that you do give, and God is using you to give, whether you're saved or not, you cast out mighty demons in the name of Jesus, but He can say to you, I don't know you, depart from me. God can use unsaved people to be very, very generous and kind. And it's sad that He uses those so many times instead of His children. Because His children are focused on greed and covetousness because what they think they have is theirs and they want to live their life and they want to hold on to their things rather than Father in heaven hallowed be your name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread because that's all we need that's all we desire and if you give us any more than that help us to see how we can be rich to others to bring about the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven here on earth in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus looked lovingly at his disciples. I added lovingly in because that's what it implies when he's looking at his disciples versus looking at the crowds. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Listen to these promises, even though there's trouble here on earth. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And the blessings that Jesus is proclaiming here are in this life and even more in the life to come. Rejoice in that day because I can't rejoice physically in this day if I'm suffering unless I know that I'm really <coughs> blessed and it, that God has given me bread and God has given me life. And there will come a time, rejoice in that day and leave for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Because I'm not fixing my eyes on things here. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus and eternal things. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Dropping down to verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good for those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. All these things that as Christian, it's not natural for me to do those things. But then there is this but. This is super unnatural for me. It's got to be from the Spirit of God. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them. That means my money and my time without expecting to get anything back. Then what will happen? Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. I know that I'm a child of God and have an inheritance because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful. That puts the bar even higher. Just as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Verse 38. Give. There's your command. Give. Give your time. Give your money. Give your talent. And it will be given to you. There's where I guess you could take that verse a little bit that I asked if that phrase was there. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now that was several chapters back in Luke. But he's writing this letter along, and we're up to this point now where Jesus was invited by a Pharisee, a hypocrite, into his home. And Jesus began by saying, Now then, this is Luke 11, verse 39, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Here we are. Well, you're not practicing any of the things that Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Plain or at the Sermon on the Mount. You are playing a game. Why? Because you're full of greed. You clean the outside and people think it looks good, but inside it is nasty and gross. It is toxic. It is deadly. But inside you are full of, what is it here? Greed and wickedness. You 
foolish, there's your word, people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Well, it's not the act of being generous that cleanses them. It's God that cleanses them because He's given them a new heart and wrote His laws upon it because they have believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Chosen One, the Messiah, the Christ who has come to forgive people of their sins. And they have believed in Him and professed in Him rather than mocking Him. And their heart has been changed and now they want to give and be generous. It's a heart thing because they don't consider the things they had anymore to be their own. So now they're generous and everything, the inside and outside, will be clean because God has made the inside clean as well. Here we are in chapter 12. Meanwhile, the crowds gather by the thousands and Jesus speaks to the disciples and He says, Beware then, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Why are they hypocrites? Because of their covetousness and greed. He tells them that everything that is done, even the whispered things in the dark, will be revealed. Jesus also tells them not to be afraid, not to be afraid of what those people can do to you, not be afraid of not having things in this world, anything else, but be afraid of that one who can throw your soul into hell. But don't be afraid because you're highly valued. Ask your Father in heaven and He will give you more of the Holy Spirit to help you live this life of Christ in this world. This light before men that they see your good, what again? Deeds. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I ask you this question. What do you value then? Do you value your time and your money? Of course you do. But do you value more than the kingdom of God? The parable of the rich fool. A parable is a further teaching illustration. Here we are. This will give you some insight and it will either deafen your ears even more or have them pass in one ear and out the other or it will bring you to realization of what Christ is trying to further teach you. So having ears, you hear what the Spirit says to the church, says to you. Someone in the crowd said to him, this is verse 13 of chapter 12, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What a strange interruption here. This does not go along with what the storyline has at all, but this is exactly what happened because we can be sitting here totally involved in doing the, the ministry of Jesus and then all of a sudden, you know, that boat that I was thinking about buying next week, why did that just pop into your mind? Why was it a desire in your heart? Tell my brother, let me find it again, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You want to see some of the most unfamily things go to a reading of a will. Or oh, even before you get there and go in and find all the things tagged, this is mine, this is hers, this is mine, before the will was even read. Wills divide so many families, so many children. Isn't a will the father's inheritance to his children? Why would we do it backwards? Why would we be covetousness and have full of greed? So this guy says, well, here's the opportunity. I, I, I don't know if he's a disciple. I don't know if he's a crowd. I don't know if he's a Pharisee. I don't think he's a crowd, but I, you don't know from this. But you've got to go based off what he says and what Jesus' answer is. I want what's here in mind, what's fair now. What's fair? Life is not fair. You sinned against God. You deserve His wrath. But instead, He pours out rain upon the just and the unjust. And He pours out grace upon you, O Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ. Wow! And not only that, you're a child of God, a group of priests, a temple. You have eternal life and you have wisdom that comes from heaven to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. How are you living? What are you proclaiming? Jesus replied, Man who appointed me judge or arbitrator between you. 
Then he said to them, to them, not just the man, all that are listening, all whose hearts have some greed and some covetousness in them, the crowd, the Pharisees, the uh, scribes, the disciples, oh, Judas and Peter and John and all the rest of us. Watch out. Be on your guard. He's already said be on your guard against hypocrisy. Now he's gone back to what he already said before when he started the conversation out in the, the Pharisee's house. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Not just the one the Pharisees had in their heart, but the ones that are in your heart. Why is that? Because life does not consist in abundance of possession. Wait a minute, I thought that's how we define the American dream. <laughs> I thought it was. He who dies with the most toys wins. He who dies, dies. And even though you could pull a U-Haul behind a hearse, it ain't going anywhere. Your children are going to fight over it. I listened to a sermon this week and it said this guy decided that um, he was going to give out his inheritance before he died so that his children could enjoy it. And he's going to sell his home and property and everything and just go live with his different children. That didn't work out so well. Because once he did that and he went to their homes, they were eager to push him out. They didn't have time for him because they were too busy following all the things their money could buy him instead of thanking their father. So what he decided to do in wisdom, I'm going to say give him a God here, I'm going to put that in there, is he took a tool case and filled it full of pennies and jingled it around and he said, silver and gold have I much. And he carried that toolbox with him and he said, Who, whoever's home this is in when I die gets this toolbox. They were fighting for him to come to their house next. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That it would divide families rather than unite families. That it would divide Christians instead of unite them as the children of the kingdom of God. Life does not consist in abundance of possession. So here's an example. The ground the ground. It wasn't anything this rich man did. <laughs> it's not even contributed to a blessing from God per se, just the ground. It's not contributed to a blessing of Mother Nature now either. Don't go down that road. But the ground, it just happened. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain. Well, let's listen to this for just a second. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build my bigger barns, and there I will store my surplus grain. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That is not there. Wow, but how many times do we live that way? Do you get up each morning and thank Him for your health? Do you thank Him for your home that you have, the children that you have, the grace that you have, the job that you have, the cancer that you have if you do? You're still here. Do you look for opportunities to serve Him? Do you look for opportunities to how to spend your time and your money? Or do you worry about the ways you want to spend your time and your money. Uh, I'm going to say again, a parable is to teach you who hear, and for those who don't want to hear it, they'll be forever hearing and never understanding. And I'll say to myself, the pattern goes on. You have plenty of grain laid up for you for many of years. And there's nothing wrong with that statement except we told you at the beginning it's, it's, it's hard. There's nothing saying I have plenty stored up. If you say, I have plenty stored up, you should say, it's time to start giving more. <laughs> Take life easy. Dr eat, drink, and be merry. There's nothing even wrong with that. 
God gave you this world to enjoy. Be thankful and praise Him. Go out and enjoy the, the sunsets and the sunrises and, and the, the, the lake and, and a boat. And you can do it in a kayak as good as in a speedboat. But hey, whatever floats your fancy. But is your heart focused on thanking God and enjoying the creation He's giving you? And realizing that you're in a fallen creation, so you have a responsibility, an obligation, as Paul says, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. But, here's a but, that complete opposite. I say all these things. All these things are about me, myself, and I. But God said to him. You know, if you look at the New Testament when God speaks, <laughs> it's not very often, and it's listen to my son in whom I'm well pleased. He has the words of life. Follow him, listen to him. But God had to say to this man, because his heart was focused on things, you fool. Everything about you has been depraved of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. You are evil and wicked, which means he has no part of an inheritance. All these things that he stored up for himself, someone will be fighting over and he will have nothing for all of eternity. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. Wait a minute, I prepared for myself a future that I could take it easy that I'd have food so that I could live. And I prepared for myself instead destruction and an eternity apart from God in nothingness. And there are many Christians who do that. There will be whipping and gnashing of teeth because they're not like Christ. They're wearing a mask and the word Christian is only a title. This is how it will be with those with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Again, we know that the salvation comes by faith. It's, not, it's a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's about faith in Jesus Christ alone. But because you are saved, as James has said, how can you walk by and see someone destitute and say, I'll pray for you, but I'm not going to do anything about it. How can you give a better seat to someone else over here and show favoritism? How can you do that? Because if you're saved, the light of Jesus Christ has come through and filled you with light so that your light shines before men and they see your good deeds. So I ask you this. How rich are you towards God? I mean, that's where we're at, period, in this, in this gospel of Luke. This gospel that he's written so that you know what you believe, so that you will live it, that you'll have complete confidence. And then we read in his, his continued work in Acts how the church did live. A little wisdom from the wise man who lost it all. Job chapter 1, verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and made off of them. They put, put the servants to sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you how terrible that is. What, who had expected something like that to happen that day? While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. When he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off of them. They put, put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you. At this Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell on the ground in worship. Wow. That is a heart that's fixated on God. I cannot 
understand or fathom, Job. I want to have that kind of wisdom. I don't want it to come from that kind of loss. But to realize that God is God and He has given to you and He has given to you the gift of eternal life should change everything and how rich you are in this world to others. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. If you could take the wisdom that you have now, would you say, I am going to do this next? Or would you say, God, show me what you desire for me to do with what you've given me? Jesus' words from Luke 12. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So I guess the wise question here is how much can I afford not to give to God? Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you for your word. I thank you for the gospel of Luke. I thank you that Paul went out and spread the gospel message to where he did and Luke became a convert that gave up his rights to be a physician, to be praised and to be rich in the ways of this world, but to, to give us this gospel message and the further uh, story of the church and the acts of the Holy Spirit through the church, Lord. I thank you that your words are true, that the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And Lord, I thank you that because Jesus Christ was, was humble and obedient, and the opposite of anything greedy or covetousness, that he gave up everything to die to save us. And Lord, I thank you now that he's at your right hand, pleading our case that we are your children. So I pray, Lord, that you fill us with your spirit to be children of the Most High, to be gracious, loving, and kind, to take away the seeds of of covetousness and greed and fill them with your mercy and grace and kindness and generosity and compassion, Father. And that together, united together as your children, we become the body that, of Christ in this world, making a difference in this world, especially in our local communities and in our country, Lord, where we've gone after the, the things of this world rather than going after you. Father, we just lift your name in holy praise for you are worthy of all glory and praise and honor. And we do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing hymn 452, Make Me a Blessing. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carrying the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sunshine.